Good evening, and welcome to the History and Genealogy Virtual Classroom. Today is April 13th, 2021, and the time is 6.35. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kelly Draper, and I will be moderating this Zoom session. Today's class, Jumping the Pond, Discovering Your German Ancestors' Place of Origin, will be taught by Scott Hall. This class will be recorded and made available on the St. Louis County Library website and on the library's YouTube channel. If you are viewing this Zoom webinar live, you are encouraged to type questions using Zoom's Q&A feature. The instructor will answer questions at the end of this session. You will find a link to the handout displayed on screen. I will now turn this over to Scott and we will begin the class. Hello to everybody. Um, welcome. And uh, it's nice to see some uh, so many people joining this webinar tonight, um, local people and also people from um, outside the state. So that's great. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Scott Hall. I'm the manager of the history and genealogy department. And tonight we're going to be talking about how uh, some some tips for discovering your German ancestral village. Before we get into that, I just want to make a little commercial announcement here, um, just to, to point out some of our upcoming classes. Uh, we will have our beginning class on Saturday, April 24th at 2 p.m. and again on Wednesday, May 5th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Monday, April 26th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we will have a really interesting webinar, the Google Earth of the Last Century Fire Insurance Maps. So if you have never used fire insurance maps and are interested in using this uh, source, this would be a good one for you to attend. Um, then on Monday, May 10th, uh, we will have a webinar uh, entitled Percy, a tool for finding articles about your ancestors. So I am going to mention Percy in this uh, webinar. So you might wanna take a note of that. It's a great resource for your genealogical research. Uh, you can register online at www.slcl.org slash events. You can also register by calling 314-994-3300 and talking to our uh, customer service people. Okay, so let's get started. So, um, you know, my, my uh, ancestry is from Germany and uh, I have found um, my ancestral villages and this is one of them. This is a map of one of them. It's a great map that I found online. It's the map of a village called Oberkreuzschwitz, which is in Bavaria. It's near Bayreuth, so it's in the uh, Upper Franconia or Oberfranken area of, uh, of Bavaria. And I found this online. This, uh, they have these 19th century maps uh, online through the Bayerische Land Landesbibliothek. So that's the state library of Bavaria. And there should be a link in your handout to that website. And right there in that circle is the house where my great grandfather Hall was born. So in this presentation, I'm going to cover basically research tips starting, you know, assuming that you don't know anything, you know, about where your ancestor came from, um, sources that might reveal your ancestral village. Um, you know, they're it, it, it's you just have to basically check everything, check every source you can get your hands on because you never know where this information is going to show up. And then I'm going to offer some tips for researching and using various sources. And so just a few disclaimers, uh, there are no shortcuts. So the first rule is you have to do your US research first. So if your ancestor came over to the United States, please do all the research you can about that ancestor. Uh, that answers the ancestor's life as he or she lived in the United States. Um, there are no guarantees, but keep trying. I mean, like I said, you never know where this information might pop up. It will help if you know some German. You don't have to be fluent, but uh, it would be helpful to know a little bit about the language, some basic vocabulary that deals with geneal genealogical terms. Um, if you can learn how to read German handwritten script and the Fraktur typeface, that would also be very helpful to you. Also, be sure you research those collateral lines. You know, the, the siblings of your ancestor, 
your, your, the fan club friends, associates, and neighbors, uh, because often you will find uh, valuable information by doing that. Um, and by doing so, you also find valuable or interesting information you might otherwise miss. And that information about that elusive ancestral village might just be there. All the sources I reference in this presentation are cited in your handout. So my first recommendation is, you know, in, when you begin any kind of genealogical research, start at home with what you have and what you know. So, you know, look through things. Do you have family letters or documents? You know, examine those. Um, if you, um, if you don't, don't know German and can't read the script, for heaven's sakes, find somebody who can uh, so that you can get a, a sense of, uh, of what's in it, who it was written by and where it was written from. So this was a, uh, I was very lucky. I inherited about 225 letters that were written to my great grandfather from his relatives in Germany. This is one, and there at the top, uh, this is from a sibling who is writing from his home, uh, my great grandfather's home village of over Preuschwitz. Also look at photographs. Do you have some of those great cabinet cards that uh, uh, came from the 19th century? Look and see if there is a photographer mentioned. <clears throat> this was a photograph that, came, that was sent to my great uh, grandfather by a relative and it was taken in by a photographer in Bayreuth. Well, I know now that uh, Bayreuth is the big city next to the village where my great grandfather was born. Look for death notices among your family papers. Also, do you have uh, Bibles or prayer books? You know, uh, look for those as well and see if they have any information in them. Hymnals, you know, uh, uh, Germans, uh, immigrants often brought hymnals or prayer books with them. Uh, many times or most times these were printed locally. So if you do have a, a hymn book or a prayer book in your possession, see where it was published. So in this case, this one was published in the Principality of Osnabrück. Now that's like saying, you know, that it's, you know, I mean, the states or kingdoms over there weren't as large as say U.S. states. This is a little bit like saying, you know, that this person was from Missouri um, or maybe from, you know, Eastern Missouri, but at least it helps narrow down your search and gives you a clue. Also, do you have artifacts like metals, plates, uh, postcards, that kind of stuff that, that mentions a, a village name on them? Like these items here, this little ceramic plate and this little medallion. Also, talk to your relatives. I mean, even if they're the same generation as you, maybe your cousins have heard, you know, stories that you haven't heard, you know, compare notes. But if you certainly if you have older relatives, then by all means, you need to talk to them and see what they know. Um, this is a photograph of my great aunt Barbara Hall. She died in 1993 at the age of 105, and she knew absolutely everything about the family history. Her father is the one that immigrated to this country, and uh, she knew the whole story. So she was uh, uh, had a lot of information. Okay, once you've kind of exhausted everything you have around the house, and you've talked to, to your talked to your relatives, and you've collected and kind of organized that material, you'll want to start finding clues in original documents and published sources. So of course, census records, and like I said, you need to do your U.S. research. And census records can sometimes give you clue, clues to the place of origin. Um, kind of depends on the year the census was taken and who was doing the, uh, taking the enumeration at the time. But of course, you need to look at this information. Census records are the backbone of U.S. research. And so that's the first thing you should look at. So in this case, uh, we're looking at the 1870 census from the city of Alton, Illinois. We're going to look at this entry here. And this is uh, the enumeration for Jakob Miller. Actually, his name is Mueller, uh, and his wife Barbara and his daughter Teresa. Well, Teresa was my great grandmother. Um, and it states over here where, you know, the place of birth, uh, the place of birth of Jakob Mueller was Hesse Darmstadt. So we all know what Hesse is. 
Essa Darmstadt was a, a principality in, at that time. But you know what, it, he consistently lists Hesse Darmstadt in the census. And so I can feel pretty confident that this is the area that he's from. Now that's a large area, but it's, it, you know, it narrows it down. It's not all, you know, at least it doesn't say Germany, which gives me no clue. It's, it gives me a specific uh, principality or territory to look at. Okay, make sure that you check all available census years for your ancestors' uh, information. Earlier years are more likely to list the specific kingdom or principality. Uh, later census years, because the instructions at, in later years to the enumerators was just to list the country, not to be any more specific than that. So in later years, you're just going to find Germany. Um, Prussia is not specific after 1866, because after 1866, Prussia controlled a lot of territory in Germany. And so, um, you know, if someone lists Prussia uh, as their birthplace, it can mean a lot of different places. Uh, but sometimes you do get lucky. And I'm going to, this is a, a very interesting enumeration from the city of St. Louis, the second ward. And this is 1860, I believe. Um, we're going to look at this entry here. So this is for Philip Mueller. This happens to be my great, great grandfather's brother, his wife, Mary and son, Louis. And it lists here Mainz Darmstadt. So what's going on here is that the enumerator has gone beyond the instructions and he has listed very specific places for uh, people living in this ward in St. Louis. Uh, you know, in this case, it uh, gets down to a major city in the area where Philip Mueller was born. I know now that that's not the exact place, but it has really um, uh, narrowed it down. So sometimes you, this is why you need to pay careful attention to the census records, because sometimes the enumerator actually does gives more information than they have to or are instructed to. Um, so keep the, you know, keep these uh, in mind, Philip Mueller in Mein Starmstadt because we're going to come back to that. Okay, church records, uh, German Protestant church records in particular are really great, uh, especially the earlier ones for mentioning the place of origin of the person. So we're going to look at this entry uh, in the church records from Emmanuel Lutheran Church in St. Louis in 1858. Um, this is for Heinrich Wilhelm Schaeperkutter, who is from Borkholzhausen in Westphalia. And he is marrying Katharina Maria uh, Uthoff from Wester Oldendorf, Hanover. So that's great. Uh, Borkholzhausen, you know, I can find that on the map. Um, a lot of people who immigrated to, to the St. Louis area came from Borkholzhausen. But Wester Oldendorf, when I try to find this village in all of the sources I have, all the maps and gazetteers and so on, there is no such village as Wester Oldendorf. So this is one of, the, one of the things you may run into. And what's going on here is that you have, you have a pastor of this church who comes from a particular place in Germany, and you're having people from all over Germany coming in and becoming members of the church. And so if, if someone is from one area of Germany and meets somebody from a completely different area of Germany, he may, may or may not be familiar with that geography. He may not, may or may not know, you know, those village names or whatever. He is only writing down what he thinks he hears. And so probably, you know, the pastor who recorded this uh, church record or this marriage record thought he heard Vester Oldendorf, or maybe someone told him that, who knows. Uh, but at any rate, I can find no Vester Oldendorf. However, um, you know, it's the kingdom of, ha of Hanover, there is an Oldendorf, I know, in Hanover, so it still gives you a clue. Uh, a published source that uh, you should check out is a, is a series of volumes by Roger Minert uh, titled German Immigrants and American Church Records. So Roger Minert and a crew of people have gone through microfilmed records from German Protestant churches, and they every time they run across a name that with the place of origin in Germany, they note that. So they're extracted out of the original records and published in this book. Um, 
they may mention the exact village of origin. Sometimes it, they just say Germany or Hesse or Bavaria or something like that, the state. Um, they are extracted from microfilm church records. This is an ongoing project. There are currently 33 volumes uh, published. We have all those volumes here in the history and genealogy department uh, covering Midwestern states, uh, Ohio, Illinois, uh, Iowa, Missouri, St. Louis, so on. Uh, but it's a work in pro progress and he's uh, issuing more volumes as time goes on. Civil death records. You should definitely try to find um, a death record, a uh, death certificate, or, you know, in the case of Missouri, death records were taken over by the, the state in 1910. Before that, they were kept locally at the county. This is a, a post-1910 uh, death record for Hermann Engermüller, and it states here that he is born in Coburg, spelled incorrectly, uh, Germany. So this is, you have to treat this as a clue. Um, when it comes to death records, death records are primary uh, primary sources for the time and place and person of death, not and they're secondary for the uh, place of birth and, and date of birth. Why? Because the only person who probably really knows for sure where he was born and when he was born is Hermann Angermüller, and guess what? He's dead. That's why there's a death certificate. So someone else is reporting this birth information. It could be a spouse, um, it could be um, a, uh, a, a child, it could be a neighbor who doesn't know anything about this person except maybe what they heard. So, but it's a clue, you have to treat it as a clue, but you, you really can't uh, take it as definitive, it's gotta be proven. Okay, German newspaper obituaries can be another source. Um, here in St. Louis, we had two uh, daily newspapers published in German, uh, Veslika Post and Anzeiger des Vestens. So this is a death notice from the Veslika Post in 1889 for Katharina Marina Buhlmann. So I'm going to translate this first line, uh, Maria Katharina Buhlmann ne Bier from Rota an der Weil, Nassau province. So there it gives an exact place of birth. However, when you start looking for this village, you find that it's actually wrote on their vial. So very, very close, but the name of the village is misspelled. But this is something that you have to keep in mind. You know, just like uh, German surnames can be misspelled or can have very variations, same thing with German villages that show up in these kinds of sources. Um, so I will just tell you that notices and obituaries in German newspapers can list the place of birth, but it's not guaranteed. Um, um, it's not a consistent thing. Um, and the reason for that is because when, by the time newspapers start publishing these death notices, they were part of the uh, classified ads and, and you had to pay for them. And I, I did a little research and somewhere in the 1880s, the price of a obituary in the Veslika Post was about the same uh, amount of money that a laborer uh, made in one day. So they were not cheap. You know, today, if you try to run a, an obituary or a death notice in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, you know how expensive that is. And for some people, you know, they charge by the word, so they try to make it as brief as possible. And this is also why sometimes you don't find death notices, it's simply the family, because the family could not afford it. However, if the deceased person was prominent, look for an article. And I'll give you an example of this. So if you remember Philip Mueller, who we saw in the census records, um, this is his death notice from the Veslika Post in 1907. And guess what? It's got all this information about when he died and so on and so forth, but no birthplace. Well, <clears throat> Philip Mueller died on a Friday and this death notice appeared on a Monday. So I started looking through the newspaper and discovered that on Sunday, in the kind of the society section, there was an, a, a complete obituary with a photograph, no less, uh, published for Philip Mueller. Uh, he was a businessman. He was a, a saddle maker. He had a, his shop at Fourth and Shoto in St. Louis. So he was well known in the community. And that's why he got an obituary in the, 
in the newspaper. But if you look at this top part, it says Philip Mueller, a well-known South uh, St. Louis citizen and businessman, was born in Ober Ingelheim in 1833 and came to St. Louis in 1858. So bingo. So Philip Mueller was the brother of my great-great-grandfather, Jakob Mueller. So this is a case where I, I researched and researched and researched my direct ancestor, Jakob Mueller, and could not find the place of uh, birth. But by researching his brother, Philip, I was able to find the, the place of birth uh, for both of these men. So let's, let's look at kind of some of the evidence we found about this, about Philip Mueller. Uh, his obituary states he was born in Ober Ingelheim. Today that is Ingelheim am Rhein in uh, Rhine Palatinate. Uh, the 18, uh, 1860 census states he was born in Mainz, Darmstadt. So let's map this out. So I went to Google Maps and I traced it out from uh, the distance from Mainz to Ingelheim am Rhein, and it's about 10 miles. So you can see that you know the census records uh, information that he was born in Mainz was not too far off. It was definitely in the area. So what's going on here? So for instance, you know if if I am from say Imperial Missouri, and I go to Germany, and someone says, "Where are you from?" I'm probably going to say, "Oh well, I'm from St. Louis." You know, maybe um, because that that's the town that people are going to recognize. The city is the next biggest city. People know about St. Louis. They don't know about Imperial Missouri. So if someone, you know, same thing with the German immigrant. German immigrant comes from over Ingelheim. The enumerator uh, who's taking the census information asks him, where, are you, where were you born? Oh, I was born in Mainz. So that's uh, something you have to keep in mind. Okay, passenger lists are another source that you definitely need to check. Um, and sometimes it can provide the information as well. So we're gonna look at this entry uh, from New Orleans passenger lists. These are on Ancestry, excuse me. Um, this is from the ship Favorite arriving on the Ju June 12th, 1842. And this is the Petting family. And it shows here that they were, it's noted on the record that uh, they were all born in Borgholzhausen. There's that village name again. Now, um, you know, again, this is kind of like the newspaper obituaries, you know, not every ship manifest is going to list the place of birth, but it's something that you need to check. Okay, here's another example. This is a New York passenger list. It's the ship Howard. Uh, arriving on the 13th of July, 1851. And we're gonna look at this family. This is uh, the mother, uh, Elizabeth Beck, and her children, Wilhelmina, Christiana, Crescentia, Wilhelm, Ernst, and Jakob. Christ Christiana Beck is my great-great-grandmother. So here they are, they're arriving in New York on uh, July 13th, 1851. So I note up here that the port of departure is Hamburg, the captain, his name is uh, Jacobs, and the ship is called the Howard. Well, I know that uh, Ancestry has the Hamburg passenger lists, the departure lists um, in their database. So I went to that database and I find the destination is New York, the ship is Howard, and the captain is Jacobs. So I know I've got the right list. And sure enough, here is the Beck family, Elizabeth, Minna, Crescencia, Wilhelm, Johann, and Jakob as they're listed here. So let's compare these two lists. Let's compare the arrival list with the departure list. So there are some discrepancies here. We have, you know, Wilhelmina arriving in New York, but we have Minna departing in Hamburg. Well, Minna is a is shorthand for Wilhelmina. And then we have Ernest, age 12, arriving in New York, but Johann, age 11, departing. Well, you know, his name, you know, might, might have been Johann Ernst. Um, and he was called Ernst or Ernest in English. And so when they arrived over here, that was the name that got written down. Who knows? And he maybe had a birthday, you know, on the way over. So he's a year older. But the big puzzle is Christiana, my great-great-grandmother, is missing. She's in the arrival list, but she's missing from the departure list. Well, if she arrived in New York, she must have 
you know, got on the ship at Hamburg unless she, you know, unless the ship left and she dove in the water and swam out there, but I doubt that was the case. So who knows, you know, who knows what happened. Um, but the important thing is, is that the, these Hamburg departure lists have the place of birth, which is Erfurt in Saxony for this family. And so there I've discovered uh, my great, great grandmother's place of birth. And just to uh, kind of confirm that, I actually have her prayer book that she brought with her, her Catholic prayer book that is stamped 1848 and Erfurt. Okay, so the departure list sources on ancestry, uh, they have the Hamburg passenger list. There is a gap during World War I. Uh, those are missing. And then the Bremen passenger list, and this is the real tragedy. I mean, they're only available from 1904 to 1939. Um, you know, in, in uh, the 1870s, they decided that they didn't need to keep these. And so after one year, they destroyed them. And so they're, you know, the earth from the earliest uh, lists until 1904, when they finally stopped destroying them, uh, those are all gone, unfortunately. And it's a really unfortunate for genealogical researchers with German ancestry because the majority of our German ancestors left through Bremen. Um, online sources, of course, include Ancestry. There is also the Ellis Island website. And of course, Ellis Island was uh, founded in 1892. Before that was um, in New York was Castle Garden is where people arrived. But uh, if your ancestor arrived after 90, 1892, Ellis Island website is a free source. And then print sources include Germans to America um, and uh, the passenger and immigration list on Philby's uh, is another source. Those are print sources that we have here in the library. There are many other published lists. Some of them are specific to a region, a, a village, a town, and so on. And uh, uh, there is a bibliography that is linked in your handout to uh, that is online. And I list many of these sources in that bibliography. Passport applications are another source. These are on Ancestry from 1810 to 1906. And so I just pulled out an example here. Uh, and we're going to look at this section and this section down here. And this is from uh, the state of Ohio, County of Hamilton. So it's probably Cincinnati. And it states, I, John Henry Team, and do swear that I was born in the town of Hagen in Hanover. So this will be the kingdom of Hanover, not the city of Hanover. So the village of Hagen. Um, but what's also interesting about this passport is it also lists his wife and children. So there you have the whole family group together. Naturalization records, you know, do try to find your ancestors' naturalization records if they were indeed naturalized. So there's there's a difference. Um, the process changed um, in 1906. So before September 27, 1906 you could be naturalized in any court in any county in the United States. After 1906, you could only, uh, the, the, the federal government took over the process and you could only be uh, naturalized in certain courts. So the, the naturalization records that were created before September 27th, 1906 often are very light on information, unfortunately, but you know, be that as it may, you, you should try to find it if you can, because you never know if that information be, might be there. So this is the uh, naturalization record uh, for uh, Georg, uh, George Mitch. This is from 1890. He was 28 years old and a native of Germany. That's all the information you get. However, if your ancestor came after September 27th, uh, 1906, Usually these records are very detailed because it asks directly, where were you born? The forms did. So in this case, this is uh, Hermann uh, Robert Rudolf Lange, 43 years old. He's a stableman. It gives his physical direction and lists his birthplace as Berlin, Germany, date of birth, his residence at the time of ap application, uh, where he departed Germany, what vessel he immigrated on, his last residence in Germany and next of kin, or his wife in this case. So lots of information there. And uh, it's too bad that 
those kinds of that kind of information was not always available before 1906. So finding naturalization records. For pre-1906 records, check state and local archives because they were generally kept locally. Post-1906, the National Archives uh, re, uh, preserves them, and those are held regionally. Uh, for St. Louis, they are held uh, at Kansas City. Um, also, check Family History Library catalog on FamilySearch. Many of these rec records have been uh, microfilmed, and they are available on FamilySearch, and they've been digitized there now. Also, check for published sources. You know, many, uh, many places have uh, available uh, in, uh, naturalization indexes or uh, abstracts, and uh, so you know, check the library catalog for you know your local, the, the place where your ancestor lived in the United States see if there are any published sources for that information. Okay, military pensions are another source. Um, you know, many German immigrants served in the Civil War. Um, in fact, it was the German immigrants who kept uh, Missouri in the Union. Um, the Germans, by and large, were anti-slavery, and they were really for the, Ger for the Union cause. So this is an example. This is a pension application file uh, filed by Elizabeth Blesser, who is the widow of uh, Georg Blesser. This is from 1884. So it, we're going to look at this section here, which states that uh, she was married to the said George Blesser by the Reverend Streving, pastor of the Lutheran Church at Hahn in Hessen, Darmstadt. So there, if that's not the exact village of birth, it's where the parish records will be. And uh, that's where you want to go, because once you find this information about your ancestral village, it's going, you're going to want to find the parish church where the records are kept. So finding military pensions. Um, <clears throat> for Revolutionary War, those are being put up on fold three, as are the War of 1812 pensions. And then for the Civil War Union, uh, there is an index on Family Search and Full Three, but you're going to have to request the files through the National Archives. For Confederate uh, pensions, those are held in state archives in southern states. Again, also, this is uh, pension files are, are also uh, sources that you know people have created index or abstracts of so um, check to see if there are indexes that are published for your for the area your ancestor lived in uh, probate and well records are another potential source so if you haven't found these records for your ancestor then please you know look for these so we're going to look at this uh, uh, will for Hermann Mollenhoff from 1849 uh, these happen to be on the Missouri digital Heritage website. And we're going to look at this section I'm highlighting here. And it states, I will unto my beloved mother, Elizabeth Mollenhoff in Berzenbrück in the kingdom of Hanover. So if his mother lives in Berzenbrück, then it's quite possible that that's where he was born. And that's where you should look for records over in Germany. So finding probate records. Uh, family search, you know, many of these records have been microfilmed by the Family History Library, and now they are being digitized on Family Search. So check the Family Search catalog. Again, there are many published index and abstracts for many, uh, many localities. And failing that, then check your local courthouse, the local libraries and archives um, where your ancestor lived. Okay, this is a really interesting source. Um, these are enemy alien registrations from World War I. So when uh, the United States declared war on Germany, a non-naturalized Germans were required to register with US Marshals in the county where they resided. So this is 1917, 1918. So we're gonna look at an example from this from um, Kansas. And this is from uh, an ancestry database uh, affidavits Affidavits of Alien Enemies, 1917 to 1918. And this is the affidavit for Albert Zockland. So we can see here, you know, this form asks all kinds of questions. And one says, asks where this person was born. Well, he states Dusseldorf, which is, you know, obviously Dusseldorf. 
Um, he probably spoke in his own dialect or this is how he thought it was spelled if he felt it, filled it out himself. But uh, it's definitely Dusseldorf, I believe. Um, and it, it uh, lists his you know, former employ employment. He's a retired US soldier. Well, that's interesting. Here's uh, some more pages from that affidavit. And uh, you know, it's, you will find out that he was served in the US infantry 1861, 1865. So he fought uh, in the Civil War on the Union side. Here's a photo and physical description of him. And then over here are his fingerprints. But this is really interesting. Look at this photo. He is in his army uniform. So he's obviously making a statement here. I mean, you know, he, he fought in the Civil War. This was taken during the World War I. You know, he has to register as an enemy alien. This person who fought for the Union Army in the United States and was a loyal soldier. And now he's being asked to uh, register as an enemy alien. And you, you can imagine what that must have felt like. So probably he decided he was going to don his uh, uniform to either, you know, prove that you know his own loyalty, or to demonstrate his own loyalty to the United States, or you know just pose the question, "What the heck are you doing here?" You know, I've proven my loyalty. I've served in the army, and here you're making me declare that I am enemy alien. So anyway, that, I just thought that was an interesting uh, aspect of this particular record. So unfortunately, um, after World War One, these were kept, you know, by the states. And many states uh, uh, felt like they were no longer needed after World War I, so they were destroyed. So the ones for Kansas are available on Ancestry. Family Search has the ones for Kansas, San Francisco, and North Dakota, and these are not indexed. You can just browse the images. Other than these, I think that these are all the ones that are still extant, unfortunately. Um, there may be other records. Uh, available at the National Archives. Um, these enemy affidavits show up in um, Record Group 21, Records of District Courts of the United States, 1685 to 2009. And those are held at regional um, NARA facilities. Okay, so another tactic is to research the surname. This strategy is most useful for uncommon names. Obviously, if, you, if your ancestor's name is Schmidt or Mueller, this is not going to work very well. Um, or if you have names that are common to a specific geographic region. So some tips. Uh, don't let it lead you on a wild go goose chase. I mean, if you, if you do find a, a name in a particular region, you know, you can kind of start doing some investigation, but don't Try not to let it lead you down too far down the wrong path. And do take spelling variations into consideration. You know, um, uh, names with umlauts in German, you know, the vowel with the two dots over, over the vowel, uh, those are German letters in the German alphabet. So names that have those umlauts, when they come over to the United States, they get changed oftentimes. Or sometimes the names get changed to what you know, anglicized to, you know, sound more English, or sometimes they get changed to sound more, making it easier for English speakers to pronounce. So you, you have to be aware of spelling variations. Um, so I'm going to take an example, and the, the example I'm going to use is the name Casehammer. So Casehammer, the way I understand it to be spelled originally is the last one in that list, but there are some other, uh, Variations here, the K A E S H A M M E R version, the A E represents the umlaut. So the two dots over a, a vowel in German represents an E. It represents an E after the vowel. So uh, just a tip there. So there is a great website, it's called uh, Geogen. Um, I have the link in your syllabus. They have changed the interface with this website over the years, and they've changed it, updated it in a way that I don't find particularly useful. I like the way it was in the old, or originally, but we'll go for it. We'll go with it. So the way you 
you way this works is that you enter, uh, well, let me back up. So this database is uh, based on data extracted from German phone books. So you think, well, how can that be useful? People move around. Well, Germans move around much less than Americans do. And uh, Germans, even to this day, they don't really wander, usually wander too far from where they were born. And so, um, so this actually becomes a pretty reliable tour. So you basically, you, you know, there's a place for you to enter the name. I'm going to enter the name Case Hammer, this uh, with the AE. Um, this, uh, uh, they, they, this website doesn't like you entering um, umlauted vowels, so I'm going to use the AE version here. And then you press enter, and, and this is what you get. And you find over here, it, it gives you this kind of uh, graph, and you can tell it, where this name occurs based on the German phone book. Well, you can see some incidences here. There's a few up here. Um, that looks like that might be Hamburg. But down here, you can see there's a lot of incidences of that name right in this area, especially in this one region. So right there. But over, if you look over here, there's a map to the left of that. And if you click on those areas, it gives you a more detailed view down to the county level. And so the most occurrences of this name end up in the Ortenau Kreis or Orten, Ortenau County in Baden-Württemberg. So my conclusion from this is that Case Hammer family possibly originated in the Ortenau Kreis in Baden-Württemberg or one of those areas around there. Um, because there are just so many, there's a heavy concentration right in that area. And I know from doing a little research on this family that, you know, I've confirmed that. Um, so that, you know, if you, you, if you use this tool and it gives you that kind of results, then definitely that's the area that you need to start looking. Um, there are also surname dictionaries. Um, these kind of give you kind of general information about the name, uh, its definition and linguistic origins, alternate forms of the name. But sometimes it will give you clues to the origin, especially if it's a more unusual German name. So it's something that you can check. Um, there is another um, source that you might be interested in checking called the Deutsches Geschlechterbuch. So this is a, a multi-volume set. There are about what, 225 volumes of this. These are compiled genealogies of non-noble families. <clears throat> in, so, in other words, someone has done the research and uh, they have compiled these genealogies for their family. They have sent them to this publisher. The publisher has gone through and done its editing and whatever and, and published them in these volumes. Some of the volumes are issued for a specific area in Germany. <coughs> and uh, the contents uh, include usually multiple genealogies per volume. So you're gonna find usually, um, unless it's a really extensive genealogy, you're gonna find more than one family genealogy uh, in a volume. They, they, they're introduced usually with a narrative history of the family's origins and the very earliest ancestors that have been documented. And then it gives detailed genealogical information about descendants, including ones that immigrated to the United States. Um, it also includes coats of arms and sometimes photos, um, which might be of interest. So how do you use this in surname research? Well, investigate the volumes that include the surname you are researching. There is a index to surnames to these volumes. We have that uh, index here in the history and genealogy department. The uh, index is by surname only. So it, if you look for the surname, it will give you all the volumes where that surname appears, um, but not the first names, just to, to uh, advise you of that. So here's an example. And of course, this was a, uh, this was uh, a volume that was published before World War II, so it's going to be, it's going to use that Fraktur typeface. It looks quite different from uh, what we're used to in English texts. But we're going to look at this entry, and then I'm just going to translate it here. This is an uh, entry for Heinrich van der Au, born in Gross Rohrheim on November 1816. So there is the exact place of birth. He died in St. Louis, Missouri, in North America. So this was someone from the Fondau family who immigrated to the United States. 
He was a footwear salesman here in St. Louis, learned the shoemaking trade and, and was a master shoemaker. He immigrated in 1846, married in St. Louis, uh, Anna Maria Friedrich, born in Darmstadt, and it gives her birth date. She also died in St. Louis, and they had a, uh, and that lists the children. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It lists that, uh, it states that she was the daughter of Johann Friedrich, who was a citizen and master cabinet maker in Darmstadt. And then uh, her mother's name was Anna Magdalena, Magdalena Bissinger. So a lot of information here in this entry. And then it, after that, it lists the children who, that were born in St. Louis, Missouri. But the main thing here is that, uh, that this guy was born in Gross Rohrheim. So even if you know, this Heinrich von der Al was not your exact ancestor, you know, he, he, you know, it's obvious that the von der Al family comes from Gross Rohrheim. So this gives you a clue of where you might look uh, for other records. You might find your direct ancestor that way. Um, I will be uh, giving a webinar about this source. Uh, it's entitled Of Non-Noble Lineage, Deutsches Geschlechter Book as a German Genealogical Source. I will be giving this on Tuesday, May 25th at 6.30 p.m. as a webinar. Um, you can go to our website and register for that webinar or call our customer service number and register that way. So if you're interested in, in pursuing or knowing more about this source, this would be a great uh, webinar to attend. Okay, other sources to check. Um, of course, there are published family histories. So, you know, look and see if there has been a family history published for your surname. Even if it's not exactly about your family, if it's the same surname, it may give you a clue to the uh, place of origin. Uh, there are also surname association newsletters, same kind of thing. There are also surname email lists and forums on Roots Web. Um, I, have off, I have found some information on that way. So that's a place to check out. And then there is also a source called the Periodical Source Index, uh, also known as Percy. This is now on Find My Past. Um, and this index is genealogical uh, and historical publications. And so you might be able to find something about your ancestor or your ancestor's family uh, in this uh, index. If you're interested in learning more about that source, uh, we do have another webinar coming up on Monday, May 10th at 6.30 p.m. entitled Percy, a tool for finding articles about your ancestors. I mentioned that earlier before I started the webinar. Okay, so you've gone through all this. You've looked at your family papers. You've looked at the, the records, the census records. You've looked at public sources and so on. And so you, you have managed to find an approximate location, maybe not the exact village, but you have an approximate location uh, where your ancestor is from. So then what? So for example, you know, this, this one census record showed that this Philip Mueller was from Hesse Darmstadt. Well, I know that there is a modern state of Hesse, but I don't know what Hesse Darmstadt is. So this is a, this is when you want to uh, maybe consult a historical atlas. We have a really great one. This one I think is probably still for sale if you'd want to buy it you know, through uh, Amazon or someplace like that. But we have copies here in our department. It's called Lands of the German Empire and Before by Wendy Unkafer. Um, and uh, here is the entry for Hesse and it gives you, you know, the historical development of Hesse. Um, you know, well, it, you will find information about Hesse Darmstadt, how it ended up being part of Hesse and so on. So this, this will help you kind of learn and understand uh, about that area where your ancestor is coming from. Um, does include a historical timeline, other kinds of information, and then a political or a map showing the political divisions. Okay, there are immigration and emigration lists and some of these are, have been published for specific uh, regions or uh, territories in Germany. Uh, one that comes to mind is the Württemberg immigration list. Württemberg was at one time a kingdom. It is now part of the state of uh, uh, Baden-Württemberg in Germany. But this, uh, there is this immigration uh, index uh, that if your ancestors from there, this would be a great place to consult. Um, 
It indexes the official records of immigration. Uh, the index gives the, the, uh, the, the person's name, the date of birth, the village of origin, the destination, and the family history film number where the record can be found. So this is important. Um, if you look at this index and you have the family history film number, you can go to family search and find that film. And probably, probably that film has been digitized. So, um, so this Württemberg Immigration Index, it is available on print. We have copies here in the History and Genealogy Department, but it is also available on Ancestry. There are many other lists. Uh, like I said, some pertain to specific locations or territories in Germany. Um, I do have a bibliography. It's linked in your handout. Uh, when you do get a hold of one of these lists, it's very important. In fact, it's very important whenever you consult a published source to read the introduction uh, for explanatory for, for an explanation of what you're what you're looking at. It's going to tell you, you know, what the source is that you know what what are they basing this index or this abstract on? What source are they using? You know, and then what criteria are they using to include that information in the index? These are important things. I mean, reading you know, the introduction and finding that explanation first is going to save you time because if they are not, you know, if what you're looking for is outside the scope of the index, then you're just wasting your time. And then again, I have a link to many of these sources in the, uh, a link to the bibliography in the handout. Okay, so you've done all your, you've done your homework, you have finally found that village of origin. So now what? So it's things to know. <clears throat> what is the exact name of the village? And um, sometimes when you find that out and you go, you, you look for where that village is, you discover that there are multiple villages with that exact same name. And a, a typical example of this, of this are villages called Oldendorf, Altendorf, Oldenburg, uh, Neustadt, Altstadt, you know, the, these, these, ter these names just mean like Oldendorf just means old village as opposed to the new village or um, Neustadt just means new city as opposed to the old city, you know, and these names are very common. They pop up a lot of different places in Germany. So you're going to have to figure out, you know, which one it is that you're wanting to look in. Also, is the village name transcribed cor correctly? I mean, you know, in some of these sources, like, you know, the example I used in this church record where it lists someone as being from Vester Oldendorf, you know, and when I went to investigate where that village was, I could not find it. So uh, sometimes these villages get uh, mistranscribed. Another example that I showed you in that death certificate, uh, the, or, not, or the, I'm sorry, a death notice from the Veslika Post. This woman was listed as being from Rota an der Weil when actually she was from Rode an der Weil. So this is something that you have to try to discover or determine, you know, is, is the village spelled correctly? And then what modern state is it in? And what larger town is it near? What parish is it in? And this is very important because probably your next step is going to be to try to find the church records uh, that this parish uh, that uh, records the the records for that for that village, and then which civil registration office does it report to? Because that's where you're going to find the civil records for that village. So to do this, there are aids to, that you can consult. Uh, one of the main ones is a is a uh, group of sources called gazetteers. These are geographical dictionaries. Probably the one that is best known and, and very useful for German genealogy is the Myers Orts und Verkehrs Lexikon des Deutschen Reichs, which means the Myers uh, uh, locality and traffic dictionary of the German Empire. So we're talking German Empire, we're talking 1870 to 1918, but that's a, a period where a lot of our ancestors uh, emigrated, but even it, it gives you information that's valid even for, for before that period. So um, there's also another one called the Genealogisches Ortsverzeichnis or Genealogical Gazetteer. That's also an online source. 
And then Wikipedia, I found, is a very good source for finding information. Just go to Wikipedia, put in the name of the village. Especially, I will say, the German version, which is wikipedia.de. Um, yes, I know, if you can't, uh, can't read German, copy the text, put it in a translation website, and you'll get the translation of it. There are also place name indexes. Uh, these are especially helpful when the name is misspe misspelled or it's partially illegible, which often happens in uh, handwritten documents. There is a series of these place name indexes uh, written by Roger Meinert. Uh, covers a lot of different uh, territories in Germany. Um, if you go to the library website and you just uh, put his name in as an author, you will get a whole list of them. Uh, but you can also search on the name of the territory. Um, his books are really great because they include a, re a reverse index. In other words, he has an index that is based on how the word is spelled with, from the beginning, but he has another index that is based on how the book is spelled beginning at the end of the word. So the last letter in the word. This is useful because if you come across a document and the first part of the name is obscured, you can look up you know, the villages that have that ending in this index so that that might help you determine what, what the name is. Okay, there are also maps. Uh, one of the really good ones is the uh, Andreas Algemeiner Atlas uh, from 1881. We have that in print in our department, but it's also on family search. Of course, there are detailed maps of modern Germany. You can find those all over on the web and in Wikipedia. Google Maps is great. Uh, I often, usually, if I'm looking for, for a, a specific village, I can just put that into the Google map search and it will take me right there. Okay, so finding original records, specifically the parish records. So in order to do this, you need to find which parish your village belonged to. We have a very useful source for this. It's called the Map Guide to German, German Parish Registers. This is a very, very val valuable tool. Um, there are, are volumes that, are, that cover historical territories, not modern states. So you have to kind of figure out what, uh, what uh, territory from like the German Empire uh, your uh, ancestor came from. But uh, once you do, you can go to one of these volumes and it will help you find the parish church where those records are going to be located for your village. What another nice feature of this is that if you find the parish and those records have been filmed, it will give you the Family History Library film number. As I mentioned, these are issued by historic boundaries, not modern states. Uh, these volumes also include other information about you know, free churches, in other words, not the official state churches, um, but uh, independent you know, Protestant churches, also Jewish records. Uh, places where you could find Jewish records. So, but the main text really talks about parishes, you know, for German and, Cat or I'm sorry, Protestant and Catholic records. So I'm just going to give you an example. I looked up this village, Allertshofen. The way this works is that there is an index in the back of the book. You look up the village name. That gives you a page number that takes you to a county with all of its parishes within that county. So in this case, I found Allertshofen on this page. It's in the county of Dieburg, and it gives you a number where the uh, references a, uh, a number above a parish key. So this is parish 18, which in this case is Neunkirchen, and then it gives you the family history library uh, film number. Now, if the, if the records have not been filmed, then that is going to be blank. But if they have been filmed and that film is available through the Family History Library, it will give you the film number. And then it gives you the location of the parish on this map of the county. So other features uh, will give you a historical overview of the kingdom or principality um, that's involved. It will give you contact information for church and state archives. Um, this will be helpful if you you know, if those records have not been filmed. Um, so yeah, just a really great tool. Um, Kevin Hansen, who has uh, created this, has done an invaluable service to researchers by creating this series. 
Okay, um, so if there is no microfilm, you know, like I said, those parish map books have information about archives, but you can also find archives in this book, Ancestors in German Archives, uh, Guide to Family History Sources. So that would be a place to search. Um, Archeon is another place where you're gonna find church records. Um, Archeon is a collaboration of Protestant church archives in Germany. These uh, Protestant church archives have been digitizing the records and contributing them to the Archeon database. Not all of the records from every archives are there. This is an ongoing project, um, but uh, they are there. It is a German website. They have an English version of the website that you can access. It does cost money. Um, the records are browsable. They're not indexed, although sometimes when you get into the images of the original records, you will find handwritten indexes. And it does cost money. Um, one, uh, you can, you basically you purchase a pass. The pass can last one month to one year. It ranges from about $25 to $215, depending on what you want. And that one month pass or that one year pass in, it has a download limit. So you can look at as many images as you want, but once you start downloading them, they start counting against that download limit. Um, I will mention that we do subscribe to that database. So if you come to our department, you can use it here for free. Um, and we are open, by the way, by appointment now. And you can schedule an appointment online or by calling our uh, customer service number. As I mentioned, download limit supply. Okay, those were Protestant records. Only Protestant records for the Catholic records. Catholic archives are contributing those to a website called Matricula. Um, they include Catholic records for Austria, Germany, Poland, Poland and Serbia. They are also browsable. They're, they are not indexed, but the good news is that these are free. So you can just go to that website and start browsing. There's no uh, fee for doing that. Um, Ortsfamilienbücher, an Ortsfamilienbücher, or another interesting source. They're kind of a shortcut to this process of finding the parish records. So um, Ortsfamilienbuch and Ortsfamilienbuch, I translate as local parish register. Ort means locality, Zippa means clan, and of course, book means book or record register. Um, and so these books are produced by someone who has gone into the local parish records and extracted all of the genealogical data out of it and published them in these books and lists the families in alphabetical order and in family groups. So um, they are based on church records. They give you, gene uh, you know, most of the genealogical data extracted from those records and individuals are produced are presented within the family units. And so if you have found one of these books, if you know they're specific to a village, if you if you know your village and one has been published for your village, not every village has one that has been published for it, but if you know your village and you've discovered that one has been published for your village, it's based on the church records. And the church records are the earliest written records for most of our ancestors. They are the earliest written records for common people. If your ancestor was nobility, then it's possible to go much farther back. But for most of us, you know, our ancestors were peasant farmers and tradesmen and so on. This, these are the earliest records uh, for them. But if you find one of these uh, Ortsibenbücher, for your village, it will take you back basically to the beginning of written history. Um, some are available on microfilm or fiche from the Family History Library. They are written in German, but they're easy to decipher if you know, if you have a basic understanding of the format. These tend to follow a common format. Um, and if you have, you know, a word list or you know basic German genealogical terms and symbols, they're easy to work with. Uh, our library has one of the largest collections of Ortsfamilienbücher in the U.S. and we have an online list and uh, they're also in our catalog and there should be I think a list linked to that online list in your handout. So just to summarize 
you know, start at home. What records do you have at home? What objects do you have at home? Talk to your aunt, to your uh, relatives, write down all the information that you know yourself and what you kind of find, uh, what you already have. Then search the original and published sources, you know, the census records, the wills, the probates, the naturalization records, all those records, do your US research. You know, uh, investigate the surname, do some surname research if that's feasible. Again, I like I said, if your name is Schmidt or Mueller, it's probably not gonna lead you very far. But if you have a more unusual name, it can uh, give you some results. Then if you have an approximate location, consult sources to narrow your search. So look at those historical uh, maps and so on to get more information about that area of Germany where you're look looking and what the modern area is. Then if you discover your village name, look for records, you know, find, the, find what parish that uh, village is in, and then try to find those parish records. So that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, we are always glad to answer any questions. You know, I'll be glad to answer questions now, but if you think of something after the webinar ends, you know, here's our uh, contact information. So do feel free to contact us anytime. And uh, I'll let Kelly take over. And if we have any questions, we'll answer those now. Okay, Vicki was asking about a bibliography with the handout. Yes. Uh, is there one, she was saying she did not see the bibliography. Was it included in those links? Um, it should be included on the handout, um, but I can, let me see. I will try to, I'll try to find it and put that link in the chat. You should be able to see the chat. The chat has been disabled, but you should be able to see it. Um, um, but go ahead and uh, let's go to the next question. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Kent, and he was asking about the Geschlechterbuch with the individual named Heinrich von der Au. Yes. And he says that he thought that individuals with a von or von in front of their name were of nobility, but the Geschlechterbuch is supposedly for non nobility families. Can you explain or correct my assumption? Yeah, so von can mean nobility, but it not necessarily. Uh, von can just mean from some place, you know, the place. So, um, you know, it, you know, uh, those kind of prefixes like that, they tend to get dropped uh, when they, when people immigrate to the United States. I mean, Fonder Owl is a name that, that you see in, in uh, St. Louis, but it was, it was, it became Fonder Owl, one word. But Fon, getting back to that, Fon doesn't necessarily mean, um, nobility it can mean but it doesn't necessarily mean it can just simply mean this this person from this place okay and another question was from vicky and she's asking if percy needs a subscription percy is on find my past and and the find my past is a subscription database but percy can be accessed for free it's uh it's it's not very intuitive on how to get to it you know, I think they sort of make it difficult so they'll make you subscribe maybe, I don't know. That's just my own opinion, um, but it is on there. It is for free. And I suggest that if you're interested in that subject to attend that webinar on Percy that we're gonna be having in a few weeks. Okay, and another question from Mary. She says the passport example you showed, was it from Germany? Did they need a passport to emigrate to the US? No, that passport was a US passport. So the the passport was applied for in the United States, and that was how the person, you know, going back to Germany to visit. So, and I mean, when when people immigrate to the United States, it depends on the period. Um, some people snuck out, and so they really had no documentation. But to uh, eventually to immigrate legally, you had to get permission, and you had to have a document that gave you permission to leave. So, um, you know, that uh, Württemberg Immigration Index, that is what that is based on. Those are based on those official permissions. And why did you have to have official permission? Because the state wanted to make sure that you are not avoiding military service and that you have paid all your debts, that you do not owe any, anybody anything in the old country before you leave. So, yeah, so the passport, those, that passport example that I showed was a U.S. passport. 
Okay, and then from Charlene, she says, you talked about Prussia. What direction should I take if that's the most information I have from the death certificate? She does know that the ship there that her ancestor left on was from Bremen and arrived in New Orleans. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, you know, when you see Prussia on one of these records, it's like seeing Germany. So, I mean, you basically just have to keep searching until you can find more specific information. That's about the only thing I can, that I can tell you, unfortunately. Unless it's very early, you know, when Prussia was not so much in control of Germany. Um, uh, they're apparently still having trouble finding the bibliography. Okay, let me, um, you know, what I will, um, what I'll do is I will, when I, when I find it, I will send out a link to, the, to everybody who registered for the webinar rather than try to do it right here. I thought it was in the handout, but maybe not. Okay, uh, and I think that's uh, everything. Okay. Well, we have a, you know, I'm just gonna pause a little bit in case there were any others. Last call for questions. Okay, so I will send out the, a link to the handout and the bibliography to everybody who registered for the webinar. So you should get that. And uh, otherwise, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Kelly? Okay, thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the class and found the information to be useful. If you have further questions or comments, please feel free to contact History and Genealogy at 314-994-3300 or by email at genealogy at slcl.org. If you're watching this live, I remind you that this class has been recorded and will be made available on the library's website at www.slcl.org slash genealogy and the library's YouTube channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, we invite you to like this video and post a comment below. This ends the webinar. Have a good evening. Thanks everybody for coming.